Hello, Eric Eisenhut here of GK Icon Academies USA with another coaches panel discussion. This is episode 20, and episode 20 today has to deal with the block save and the differences of technique, when to use, how to use, the difference between the 50 50, and we'll talk really, we'll get really into a lot of detail with that as we go on. With us today, we have Zach Kruger. Zach is the head coach at Seton Hill University here in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And we also have with a special guest, Michael Collin, Micah Collins. Micah is with the Philadelphia Union. I'm the youth programming director. And he was the goalkeeper coach at Michigan State for both the men and the women. He also played at Villanova and Penn State. So let's welcome our guest today. Zach, let's start with you. How are you doing today, sir? So good, man. How you doing? Good, good. Good to have you back, my man. Always. Yeah, Always. And our special guest here, Micah. How are you doing today, sir? Doing well. How are you? Good, good. Micah, we're going to jump right into it. I'm going to start with you. Let's start with a quick definition of the 50-50 save versus the block save. How would you define both uh, – versus reaction save. My apologies. We'll get to the block save in a moment. 50-50 save versus the reaction save. What are the basic differences there? Yeah, 50-50 save is more – a 1v1 situation, say, balls played through, we have to come out, or balls crossed and we have to come out and make ourselves big. Whereas reaction save can kind of occur anywhere. It could be an 18 shot from outside the 18, it deflects off someone, and we have to make a quick reaction save, or it could be about five yards away, and we just have to, you know, use our instincts and make a reaction save that way. Micah, talk a little bit more about the technical piece to the 50-50 and as well as the reaction save. What are the differences from a technical standpoint when making both of those saves? Um, for, for the 50-50 save, it's really important to close space as much as you can be big. And the biggest thing is, I guess, bravery comes into it as well. And that involves just being body weight forward, keeping our head forward. A lot of goalkeepers, especially young, um, it's hard to teach that, keeping your head in front of your in front of your body um and you'll see them fall backwards to do a kick save. there's nothing wrong with a kick save but they'll fall backwards and kick their feet out and you're, you're just less likely to make the save once you start to fall backwards so that's kind of the technique that comes in to the 50 50 save whereas um reaction save is kind of more instinctual i think um you do want to teach uh you know good set position all that stuff but in the end it just comes you, you have to do a lot of quick um, qu balls close to you, use tennis balls, different kind of stuff to train your action save, whereas 50-50 saves more, um, you know, balls played through, and we have to come out, make ourselves big, body weight forward, and stuff like that. Excellent. Zach, let's get into the, um, the technical component to the reaction save. What are the differences in the set position on a normal set position versus a reaction save when the shot's maybe three to five yards away from us? Yeah, I mean, I think that varies – from goalkeeper to goalkeeper, um, I think you need to know your goalkeeper and be understanding of what their strengths and what their weaknesses are when it comes to reaction saves. Uh, you know, for example, like I was working with uh, Nick Noble a little bit when I was with the Islanders, and you know he's like six three, six four, so he's super tall. So he would always get beat around his ankles, on, and especially stuff that was near and close to him. Um, like if someone got end line and, and slid the ball back, he would always get beat on that you know that low shot. So we actually dropped his set position a little bit, get his hands a little bit lower, so he had a little more time to get down and, and make a save. Um, so I think it does come back to knowing your goalkeeper, but also teaching a proper set position for that, for that goalkeeper. So um, like Micah kind of said, people like to rock back and they get, you know, their shoulders behind their hips, and then they start making saves with their feet. So, you know, from, from my point of view, as much as I've taught it, it is about keeping your face down, you know, your, your shoulders down, um, and, and just not letting your shoulders fall behind your hips, and then you have a better chance of making a save. There's two weaknesses areas. One's going to be over your shoulder, and one's going to be down by your ankles. And those are the two spots that you're going to have to really work to be quick at. And usually that's come from, like, some core training uh, to be explosive, to get down, or, or to be able to get your hand up quick. So um, that's kind of the main areas that I've worked on in, in that area. Um, but, yeah, it definitely comes back to knowing your goalkeepers and knowing how they, how they play and how they react to things and, you know, their physique as a person. So how do you go about, Micah made a great point about being brave. How do you teach a kid in the academy level to be brave with the 50-50 save? I think it's about expanding their comfort zone, right? If you're only staying in their comfort zone and training that, then when a situation that's outside their comfort zone comes in, 
then they're not going to be prepared for it. So one of the things that I do is I, you know, I teach them from a young age hand position, right? When they're catching a ball in a certain way, um, if they're low on the ground, using the ground as a third hand and then get them comfortable with that. Like those are the basics, right? So once you get on their basics, then you can start to expand that. So one of the things that I do is I start with, you know, a box that's, uh, let's just say three yards by three yards. And then you, you start to stretch that range with that hand shape and making saves comfortably. After that, you, you try to do stuff like, like I said, filter in some tennis ball stuff. I do a lot of ping pong ball work with my goalkeepers. Uh, I think that's very helpful. So it, it, you're just training that hand-eye coordination, and then as they get older, they start to get more confident with it. So as you're, as you're working with a young goalkeeper, just keep, continue to build that confidence with their hands. Nice. Michael, what's your take with, with, with a kick save in that situation? Is it valuable? Is it a valid resource? That seems to be a new development with, let's say, a new development within the last 10 years, let's say. when I'm going to date myself here, but when I was a, a kid, I, it was almost you never made a kick save. That was just the thing. You know, everything's with your hands. Now you see the likes of De Gea making kick saves onto me, which would be a normal low ball catch or dive. And you see these these. these highly goalkeepers making these futsal kick save what's your take on that type of kick save in this reaction save environment yeah so we started training that with the guys and girls at michigan state um this year just because before i felt it was taught to kind of kick your legs out if the ball's like uh zach was talking about if the ball's close to your ankles to kick your legs out and try to get your hand down whereas it seems a little bit more practical to actually use your foot um so we started teaching that. I actually watched a lot of YouTube videos um, on what to do. And I mean, still, again, the same principles apply, teaching to keep the body weight forward, the hands forward, all that stuff. And like we teach with saves, at least with dives, trying to shoot two hands to the ball. So again, trying to always get two hands to the ball. In that situation, trying to get two limbs to the ball. So really trying to teach, kick your leg out, but also try to get your hand there as well, which will naturally keep your body weight forward. So um, I'm all, you know, I just, in the end, you, you want to make the save. And it seems pretty practical, um, that approach, if it's to your ankles to try to get your leg out. But again, it's, it's hard to train that habit of keeping your body weight forward while you do it. So yeah. that, that's the biggest thing I'd say is two, two limbs to the ball, body weight forward when you train that. Yep. I, I agree. I think I see, we was mentioned earlier, sometimes kids, when they're out of their comfort zone, will start to lean back a little bit. And when that ball's in that low position, you see that hockey like kick save and then they flop back landing on their back i mm -hmm. couldn't i want you to, i love that point you mentioned and, and really want to really put this point home you stay forward and even though that kick save's still there in that situation where the ball's by the ankle you want to still be leaning forward not back and i think that's a misconception with that save so i'm glad i'm really glad you brought that up um we'll get into the differences between an actual breakaway coming at you with the reaction save versus somebody cutting that ball back inside your six, taking that shot three to five yards away from you, getting set. What are the main differences? And there are some obvious ones. I'll let you guys elaborate on that. But what are you looking at? What's different? What other little cues are, might you be taking from the shooter um, in those two situations. Zach, I'm going to start with you. If you could just compare the breakaway to that cut back quick shot type of deal. Yeah, breakaway situation, you're, you have a lot more time to read the forward. Um, you can read the touches that that forward has. So you can kind of plan your attack. Uh, you have a little more time to plan that attack. A uh, cut back situation is when the, a forward uh, may, or a midfielder gets end line and they angle the ball back. We, you know, some people call it a bangu or a six ball or a seven ball where they – you know, they're sliding the ball back towards the PK spot from the end line. So then you're, all, you're hugging, you know, closer to your near post, then you're going to have to have some sort of footwork and then try to make a save very quickly if, if they would make that, um, that shot happen. So it's, it's a lot less time uh, to think and to prepare for that shot that's coming. So the, the breakaway situation is you're trying to have proper timing. You're trying to limit them to maybe a, a situation where, you know, if they're coming straight down the middle of the goal, you have an opportunity to force them one direction. Hopefully you get them to kind of, you know, veer to a side. If they're right footed, maybe you want to get them to go on their left foot. There's always little tiny details that you can look at. But um, when I was younger, the thing that always helped me in those, in those moments was watching the moment that they touch the ball and the distance that the ball gets away from that forward. That gives me a window of an opportunity to make that, that 1v1 save. So uh, if, if there is no window to make that save, 
uh, and they keep the ball close to the foot. Like if you ever watch Messi dribble one v one, he keeps the ball so close to him. He doesn't let any window of an opportunity for you to come in and get a tackle in or a, or to make that one v one save. You know, then that, you you have to start to think about the the like a starfish style save. I don't know if that's you know the appropriate term for it, but that's kind of what I've heard it as. Uh, where, you know, you can drop a leg and, and you can stay forward and get big. Um, so there's that option. And then we, we teach stalking, which is trying to continue to move your feet, stay on your feet while that person is, you know, one or two yards away. And as they're going to a side, try to make that save in there as well. So um, those are the main differences between the two. They're totally different situations, and there's a lot that goes into them. Um, but each of them have their own style save that you can make. But, it, again, it just it's going to depend on – you know, what are you reading? What are the cues that, are, that you see that you're, you're you know, kind of breaking down to be able to make that save? Michael, what's your – Zach made an awesome point about st- stealing space and, and creeping forward and watching the touch and when the ball's off their foot, stealing space, and when it's near their foot, you know, starting to get ready for that shot, so to speak. What are you looking for when that, 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 the, that forwards turn the corner on your defender is now looking to cut back? What are your visual cues? What's your footwork when that pass is made? Um, usually they're on the outside foot. So if, if it's on, you know, they're going down, it's a left winger, they're on their left foot. So it's going to be an outward bending ball. Um, what you look for is um, his eyes. So you look where he put or she put, uh, picks her head up. So a lot of times in that situation, um, they're going to look to hit it to um, the PK spot or something like that. So usually you're on your near post, kind of depending on where, he or she is on the end line. Um, if you look at that, sometimes they'll shoot. If they look up straight at you, then get set for a shot. However, um, I'm thinking back to the MSU guys and girls, just learning to steal that space. You read their eyes, they pick them up. So I actually take a couple of little steps to try to cut that pass off if I can. However, again, it's, this is all split second stuff. Um, if I can't get there, I, I have to read that quick. I can't get there. Then I'm basically taking a crossover step um, trying even maybe even sprinting and just trying to make myself as big as possible. Um, again, that bravery comes in just sprawling out. Um, again, different situations, we might just make ourselves big and we'll, we'll go into a block save or we're just throwing our hands to the ball, throwing our bodies to the ball, trying to make that save. So, yeah. One of the things that I always taught my guys was, listen, if they're outside the 18 and they're getting in line, it's almost like drop back into your, into your touch line on like your goal line. And then there's probably going to be a flight and service more than a, a driven ball on the ground. If they're inside the 18, I would say what, what you just described, Michael, is kind of start to read those things, start to come out, try to be big, because it's going to be a closer, more reaction-style save than a, than a flight at service. Definitely. Yeah, and, and the other thing, too, I, I see with that movement, when you're facing the server, let's say it's a goalkeeper's right, and they're coming down and they slight that ball on the floor, if you can, read, if you can make that save right there on the cross, that's to me a, a gr- almost a great shot stopping save. Like that's a great save. And I think a lot of kids will stay away or stay in the goal, not thinking that that's a save. That's a save because if you don't get that, that forwards right there for that one touch. Now, if you do stay away, the one piece I see a lot of younger goalkeepers making is an error with their footwork where they're leaning forward into the, the person who's going to be cutting that ball back. But that first step isn't a hard pivot to get them that cross step to make, to take a lot of space across their goal. It's more of a step in a 45 to 90, almost straight out. So now they're running at an arc to get to that ball or to get to that person who's going to one touch that shot. And in in the meantime, they're leaving the whole goal open. And I don't think they see that until in training, they're almost playing the role of the forward. And I think that's one of the situations I like to sometimes put my goalkeepers in is the role of the forward so they can see it through the eyes of the forward and exactly what they're seeing and how the goalkeeper's movement impacts the size of the goal. You're trying to make this goal as small as possible. Mm -hmm. And I think sometimes your direction and your footwork to get to that spot, to make yourself big, to get in that block save, the starfish, however we call it, is essential because it's, you're dealing with angles. And if your angle's off, the goal's huge. And Mm -hmm. I think that's a very important piece. I love how you both touched upon that. Let's get into the block save or the K save or the starfish save. There's so many ac- uh, names for this damn thing. Um, what's the role? Let's get back into the, the, the work, the footwork component to it. Mike, I'd like to start with you, if I may. What's the role of the feet? Is a kick save good? What's the set position? Leaning forward, leaning forward, leaning back. Where are your hands? Let's talk to that if you could. Yeah, in this block save, um, 
essentially i i like to teach everyone's a little bit different but i i like to teach if you can get your hands to the ball get your hands to the ball so if it's 50 50 hands to the ball if we can however there's situations where the attacker gets to it before we can and we have to make ourselves as big as possible um this block save is something i personally never learned as a player we didn't teach it However, as a goalkeeper coach, it's starting to get more popular. And so that's something, again, I had to go online and look, you know, what's the technique of all this stuff and start teaching it to the guys and the girls. Um, and, and basically the theory behind it is just to avoid, I remember getting megged a lot as a goalkeeper. Um, so it's trying to eliminate that spot. But then now you're exposed when you put your knee down and you kick your, and your leg up, you're exposed kind of, um, it's hard to describe through here, but you're exposed uh, behind in between one of your legs. So you basically have to get your hand there to cover for it. But the theory behind it is just covering space and trying to get um, as big as possible. So that, that's the keys I, I try to teach the guys or the girls when I'm doing it. You want to get as close to the ball as you can or cover as much ground as you can, as big as possible. How do we make ourselves as big as possible? We sprawl out, we get our hands wide, our legs big, and then body weight forward. So those are kind of the, the keys for me when we do that. Um, and getting set if we can. like. And then that kind of plays into if we can get set or our body weight can be forward, we're more likely to make the save. Right. Zach, Micah made a comment on hand position. What's your hand position or what are you teaching your goalkeepers to do in that block save? Where are the hands? Yeah, I mean, I like how Micah said it's something that's new. Uh, I was never taught it either uh, growing up. And, you know, I've ha also had to do a lot of research on this and try to get familiar with it to be able to teach it um there's some great resources out there the, the the keeper institute in new jersey they put out a ton of videos on this on this topic and um there's just awesome content on there so if, if you're someone that doesn't know much about this that's where i've done a lot of research at so um obviously former national team goalkeeper who runs that so she got a lot of a lot of knowledge but you know i really think the way that i've taught it is the my i, I teach through analogies um, so making it something they're familiar with. Um, and the one thing that I felt like with the starting position in this, this block save, it looks like a hockey goalkeeper. So your, your hands are kind of out, you know, like and out to your side so that they're not like central anymore. They're more out to the side, almost like a breakaway save, but not as low as a breakaway save. So I kind of start them out a little bit wider, almost like you have like two gloves on. You know, so that's kind of how I started. And then I'm like, you're going to, you're going to gain real estate or take or gain ground as fast as you can get as close to that ball as possible uh, in that position. And then you're just going to try to expand that range to be bigger. So your hands don't really ever drop. Um, you're just trying to get as big as possible. So it's kind of like you're opening up your wings. So you go from that hockey goalie to like opening your wings. Um, and the, depending on what the angle is and which leg you drop, that one hand can drop down just a hair just to, to cover like what Micah was saying, that space behind. Yeah, that's kind of how I've taught it. Say that one more time. I mean, that's just kind of how I've taught it in the past. Yeah, yeah. no, I, I get it. And the one thing too, I, 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 you see, it is new, right? Like just yeah. uh, five years, 10 years ballpark, it's new. And it's something that I've seen a lot of goalkeepers utilize, but I'm seeing a lot of younger goalkeepers utilize it in the wrong times you know so it's like it's also not only is it a technique it's a when component too and mm -hmm. i see a lot of kids trying to make this block save when the shot is six seven eight yards out and and so they're trying to make themselves big but the, the angle's too big so they're set position they should be in that normal set hands a little wider maybe they're not going to make the catch so their hands are a little wider um for a parry yet these kids are in a block save and kids are just shooting around them. So I think that the, the goalkeeper coaches out there train the when, when is this efficient? And I think once they can understand that, the positions and the movements become a little easier. In addition to that, you mentioned, we were talking about feet and footwork. When the shot's taken, let's say you're going out and making yourself big and you drop a leg, like you were talking about that one leg's kind of tucked underneath and that other hand is right by that ankle your other leg might be extended straight out with your other hand on top of it, taking away that, that, uh, that far side, we'll call it. And if you're leaning forward, there's a component to it where once that save's made, we need to understand that there's a second save that's going to happen here. Because if you make this save on any of these, the block, the 50-50, or the K save, the starfish save, whichever you want to talk about, or the re quick reaction save, chances are you're not catching this ball. Right. And, and I always say, mm -hmm. even after you make right. the save, if you're on the ground, you can still talk. So while you're getting up, 
to get back into that back into the play for that second save, you can be yelling at your at your defenders either keeper if the ball's right there and you jump on it, but most importantly, you're probably going to be yelling away. So even though you're on the ground, maybe out of position, but you're getting up, you can still be yelling at somebody away and getting them to just clear that ball out there if they're there. Right. So I want kids to make sure that they can still communicate despite being in that transition from the original save was made into the second save opportunity. And let's talk about the, the, um, the recovery component because there are a lot of different ways to get off the ground nowadays. I want to talk about the spin. So if you're on the ground and you spin on your backside and pop and go the other direction versus the just popping straight up. Mm -hmm. Michael, what's your, what's your opinion on the two? When would you use either or do you push one versus the other? Um, this is something, again, I never learned the spin as you see it in a lot of South American. When I watch a lot of South American videos, I see it a lot of quick spin their body up quick. Um, this is something I taught uh, the guys. I didn't get to it with the girls on, at, at Michigan State um, just because I wanted to have their arsenal full. I wanted them, you know, to be able to do it if they could. So the starter actually got really good at it. So he he could do it. But I think we all, especially in in, in America, we're, we're more used to the traditional getting up and quick. Um, I don't know the exact situation. I've never seen them using a game. I personally, maybe back in indoor when I was little, I use it just, you know, by coincidence. Um, but yeah, um, I just think it's important to teach both, teach everything that you can. And um, as a goalkeeper, get, you know, to, to learn each. Fair. Yeah. Um, yeah uh, when I was in, I, I used to live in Baltimore and I used to work with the Baltimore Kings goalkeepers and, um, I had a, I had a goalkeeper who was the starter at Howard and he was, he was, uh, he was very good. Uh, he was, he was a really good goalkeeper, but he was that style. And one of the things that I was teaching with all those goalkeepers at that time was how, you know, properly get up quick, move back to your feet, move. And then he consistently would spin and get up. And I was like, listen, man, I don't want you to lose that. Like, I don't want you to stop doing that. I think it's awesome. I'm not going to be teaching that to these other guys, but it's a, he gets up so fast by doing it. He's just so used to it. I think it's like a, the style, like what kind of Micah said. But, you know, I think you have to keep in perspective of, of, you know, what has your goalkeeper been told year after year after year. And if that's their style of getting up quickly and they're good at it, then by all means, don't try to force them to change. I think you just got to kind of roll with it and, you know, and just try to continue to help them with their footwork once they do get up and find, you know, get up back on your ball line, find your eyes to the ball, all those kinds of things, break down, get back into your set, all those other things you can still coach if, if this is not something you want to bang your head against the wall with. So I do think it's awesome to teach it to people. I think it should be taught when they're younger, um, especially properly getting up and not getting up from your butt. I think that's huge. Um, but yeah, when you're working with someone who's a little bit older and who's been doing it for a long time, it's going to be a lot harder to to um, change the way that they've been doing it their whole lives. Yeah, because it is an instinctual movement. It you is. Know, right? Like, it's one of those movements that you're just – it's like there's a rebound. It, let's put a scenario out there. You're inside your six. You just made a save. You got to get up. Instinct tells you get up. And how you do it, people are taught different ways at the younger levels. And it's okay, and it's great. Mike, I love your point about just improving upon the size of their arsenal, right? Like, can we give them more tools in their toolbox – and I have always been taught to just pop up. So if I'm, if I'm lying here, pop up, I push. Yeah, you, especially now with the 50-50 with that K save, starfish save, if you go down and make that save properly, you should be able to just literally stand right back up if you're doing it properly. One hand, one leg's out, one hand's out, one leg is underneath you in a bent position. You should be able to just push, push off the ground and just stand right up to where you were, yeah. eliminating a spin extra movement and eliminating a almost a push-up type movement from what I was taught. So it's quicker if you can utilize that K starfish type save that we talked about. Um, so it's amazing how much this situation has transformed in the last, I mean, this 25 years, 20 years, it's come a yeah. long way. And you mentioned guys yourself, you didn't know the spin part of it. You know, it's new to me. I love it. I do, but I, I think it, there's a situational time for it. And there's a situational time for the others as well. But to have all of those tools in your toolbox is so important. I love that analogy, Micah. I'm going to steal it and use it, man. Like your residual income is coming to you in the mail. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if you make a save near post, right, and then you give up a rebound that's going towards your back post, more likely than not, you're going to swivel without even knowing it. Mm -hmm. So it becomes instinctual at times. 
Right. hundred percent agree with that. I do. Um, guys, great. I want to just wrap this up. If I could, a few minutes left here, I'm going to start Micah, if I may with you, what are your final comments? What's your advice to Academy goalkeepers with the development of this block save versus reaction save versus 50, 50 and the technical opponents to it. And especially the when components to them. So let's summarize that if you may. Yeah. Um, I think the most important is getting reps at it. So train it. A lot of goalkeepers, when we're young, um, you get a ton of shots. So you become a really good shot stopper. Um, and we even can go into crosses about this, you know, make sure you get reps and crosses. Cause when we're, when we're out, especially recruiting at the, um, college level, you know, you'll see every goalkeeper is good at shot stopping, but they're not good in the air because they don't get reps. So it's the same, same concept. Make sure the more reps you get, the more you're going to get better at it. Um, it is tough to duplicate, um, replicate uh, breakaway situations. You have to have a lot of goalkeepers who are willing to go full speed and go 1v1 um, against each other or do all this stuff. But what I found um, is using like softer balls. If we can, it helps you get more reps. Um, kind of like those squishy balls that you use in gym class um, for dodgeball. So just using those and that helps to teach bravery. That helps um, teach, get your body weight forward. And you can do, you can get a lot more reps. When you're starting to get pounded as a goalkeeper, you get 10 reps of a hard like ball just straight to your chest. You start to, you know, like not want to do that as much, um, you know, even every, all of us naturally. So again, I think the biggest thing goes back to just the more reps you get, the more you can replicate it in training the better you're going to get and the more you're going to be able to read the situation of when to get the block, when to shoot your hands to the ball. Um, maybe when the ball is a bangu, we, we drop on our line or, you know, we come and we, we be brave and make ourselves big. So that's my biggest, biggest thing for them. All right. So we used to do something very similar where if you have, if you're in an athletic department and there are other sports in your athletic department, capitalize on their equipment. And what I mean by that to Micah's point is I use volleyballs. You were talking mm -hmm. about those soft nerf balls. If you have an el like, we're at elementary school, middle school with the mm -hmm. dodgeball stuff. If you have access to a gym, a clot locker room, that is a great ball to use. That nerf ball is what volleyballs are because they're not going to hurt the goalkeeper. And, and it's a good from an academy level perspective and in, in being able to develop bravery and that it won't hurt. That's typically the way what bravery is, right? I don't want to deal with the pain. So they, ah, I'm not brave enough. But if you aren't, if you're comfortable with it and you know it's not going to hurt, it's a different story. So I, I love the idea of teaching them with a softer ball to, to create a positive environment with that type of save because it is a close range, painful save if done incorrectly. Yeah, my dad was my coach growing up and he worked with me and one of the things that he used was like the old indoor soft soccer balls that they had. And they didn't really hurt that bad. It was actually really interesting that, you know, if you took one to the face, it really, it didn't hurt that bad. It was really cool. So that helped me get, gain confidence as a young goalkeeper. Nice. Zach, yeah. continue, please. If you could wrap up what you – same yeah, question yeah. I gave to Micah, if I could send that your way, please. If I can give it from like – because I, I think these are all great points from a, a player's perspective, but from a coaching perspective, I think when you're teaching this stuff, you need to remember the five W's, right? The five, like the what, where, when, why, and, and, and all those kinds of questions that are going to be running through a goalkeeper's head. So as a coach, when you're planning something out, we're trying to remember that kind of stuff because – it is a lot of it is situational. You have to think about who's got the ball, where's the ball at, where's that player going. So you run out like tons of different scenarios, but like try to train and answer those questions as you're training that goalkeeper because, you know, everything is going to be changing in, in the seconds of the game. And um, I think if you're not answering those types of questions, the goalkeeper is still kind of in limbo. So just try to remember that as you're planning a session and be able to answer their questions when they have them. Yeah, I think video can assist in that as well in regards to showing when in that situation. So hopefully they can you know, resonate. And then when they see it, you know, and through training and also in the game environment, and they can react accordingly. That's a yep. great point. That's a great point. Well, fellas, I want to say thank you for your, your time today. Zach, Micah, great having you on. Very, very appreciated. Always. Yeah, thank you. You're welcome. Everybody, want to say thank you for your time today. We'll see you in the next episode.